Okay, we're going to talk about Chapter 3, um, Molecules, Compounds, and Balancing Equations. On the far right of the periodic table, we have the alkali metals, and the alkaline earths are in the second column. Then we have the transition metals stretching across, and as we get to the right side of the periodic table, we have the nonmetals. On the extreme right, the very last column, is called the noble are uh, the atoms are called the noble gases they don't react very much um, although the larger ones can be forced to react but the ones we're interested in mostly are the ones in the box here the nonmetals and they form chemical bonds by sharing their electrons so how does it work let's see well suppose we had uh, one hydrogen atom next to another hydrogen atom, as they approach each other, what we see is that the electron of one can become attracted to the proton of another, and vice versa. So you get these increased attractions, which lowers the energy and forms a stable chemical bond between the two hydrogens. So they're sharing their electrons that is a covalent bond. By the way, hydrogen is not the only element that forms a stable molecule. Atomic hydrogen, a hydrogen atom by itself is not stable. Hydrogen bonded to itself as a molecule, a diatomic molecule, is stable. And so are many of the nonmetals. The halogens, for example, F2, Cl2, Br2, I2, all share their electrons to form stable diatomic molecules. Same is true with oxygen, and same is true with nitrogen. O2, N2. Stable molecules form when atoms share their electrons. Now, a little bit about the nomenclature of covalent molecules. When you form a covalent molecule, if it's very common, it may have a common name. For example, water, H2O, everyone knows that. You probably don't recognize it as dihydrogen monoxide, but that is a more systematic name for water. In fact, uh, Penn and Teller have a hilarious uh, YouTube video where they infiltrate um, an environmental affair and go around telling people about the dangers of dihydrogen monoxide and most people thought they ought to ban the substance it sounded so terrible but yeah it's just water but carbon dioxide we don't call this dihydrogen we just call it hydrogen and nitrogen uh, dioxide so, what are the rules um, for naming covalent compounds? Well, first of all, we use Greek prefixes to denote the number of atoms. So, for example, we have di, meaning two, tri, meaning three, tetra is four, penta is five, hexa is six, hepta is seven, okay, octa, of course, is eight, and we use these prefixes to indicate the number of atoms. So if we have a formula dinitrogen trioxide, how do you think that's going to play out? How about N2O3? Or P2O5. What would be the name for P2O5? Well, how about di? phosphorus, and it looks like five oxygen, so that's pent oxide. Now notice this, the element which is second does not maintain its exact same name as the free element. It's not pent oxygen, it's pent oxide. The second element gains an IDE ending. It's truncated and it gains an IDE ending. So that's a fairly uniform rule. Now we can represent 
covalent compounds of the molecules thereof as models. So here we have methane, CH4, but how does that actually look? How are the hydrogens attached? Are all the hydrogens attached to each other? Well, they're not. Each hydrogen is attached to a carbon, and we depict that with what's called a structural diagram, where we show that each hydrogen is connected to a carbon in two dimensions. But organic is, and many other inorganic compounds, are three-dimensional. And we sometimes, if we need to know the actual structure of the compound, we'll get a model kit and make a ball and stick model and see that it's a tetrahedral shape, not a flat shape, not a square, but a tetrahedral shape. And another way is to use space filling models where the atoms are more representative of what the molecule actually looks like. What about a different kind of bonding? So far we've just talked about the nonmetals over here bonding to form molecular compounds. What happens if a nonmetal over here and a metal from the metal section get together? What happens? Well, the usual rule there is that the metals tend to lose electrons to gain either a plus one, plus two, or some cases a plus three charge. Remember, if you have an atom like, well, let's, let's do it with, uh, with hydrogen, right? Hydrogen is a plus, and then there is an electron outside in, a, in an orbital outside the nucleus, but you have a neutral atom because you have one minus charge and one plus charge. And if the hydrogen loses that electron, all you're left with is a plus charge. Likewise, if you have lithium, lithium has a nucleus that's going to have three protons in the nucleus, and then it's going to have an electron and another electron and another electron outside of the nucleus in shells or orbitals as they're called, and when one of these electrons is lost, is given up, and lithium tends to give up one of these electrons very easily, you now have three positive charges and two negative charges. You're left with a plus one charge. This is no longer called an atom, it's called an ion. We call a positive ion a cation. Metals form cations by giving up one or two or three electrons. How do we know how many electrons they're going to give up? We look at the periodic table. The first column, all these elements in the alkali metals tend to lose one electron to become plus one. All of these in the alkali earth column tend to lose two electrons to become plus two. And over, skipping over the transition metals, over here we have for aluminum and gallium, we have atoms that can lose three electrons and become plus three charged. Now that we have positive ions, we also have to have negative ions, and that's where the nonmetals come in because the nonmetals tend to gain electrons. The halogens, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine, tend to gain one electron. Now that will give them one extra negative charge, and there'll be minus one charge on those ions. Oxygen, sulfur, selenium, these all tend to gain two electrons to become minus two ions. And we even have a couple that gain three electrons. Nitrogen becomes nitride, phosphorus becomes phosphide to become minus three ions. Negatively charged ions are called anions. What happens when a compound forms, or how does a compound form now, 
If, for example, we have our lithium, our Li plus, as one ion, and we have fluoride as another ion, these two can attract each other because a positive ion is very attracted, strongly attracted to a negative ion to become LIF. A metal plus a nonmetal gives us a salt. So lithium fluoride is a salt. Now, you know, uh, you talk about table salt, that would be sodium chloride, but the same idea. A positive plus one sodium ion together with a negative minus one chloride ion makes NaCl. When these ions form compounds, the total positive charge must equal the total negative charge. If you have a sodium plus one and, and an oxygen minus two, then together they're not going to be balanced if you only have one sodium. It's going to have one extra negative charge. For sodium oxide, we need two sodium cations at plus one each to match one oxide anion at two minus. So the formula has to be Na2O. Now, uh, an easy numeric is when the charges are unequal. If they're equal, then you just put them together. You don't have to worry because the charges are going to balance out. But if they're unequal, here you have a plus one, here you have a two minus, you can get a quick idea by taking the absolute value of the charge of each one and using that as a subscript for the other. So the two on the oxygen becomes Na2O. And that way you're going to end up with two positives to match two negatives. So what is the formula for aluminum sulfide? Aluminum, if you remember, is a plus three ion. So we have Al3 plus. And sulfur is a negative two. That's S2 minus. These don't match. We can't put A at one aluminum together with one sulfur because we'll have one positive charge not being balanced out. So what do we have to do? Well, we can use the numeric here. Put the 3 down as a su subscript for the sulfur, the 2 down for a subscript for the aluminum, and what we'll end up with is Al2S3. Now just think about this a minute. Aluminum is plus 3. We have 2 of them. That's plus 6. Sulfur is minus 2, and we have 3 of them. That's a minus 6. 6 positive charges, 6 negative charges, ends up with a neutral, a neutral salt. So our salt is aluminum sulfide. Now, what about these transition metals? So far, it's been pretty simple. Alkali metals plus 1, alkaline earth metals, group 2, uh, plus 2. But what about all these transition metals? Well, the thing with these is they can have variable oxidation states, which means they can give up different numbers of electrons. When that happens, you have to indicate the oxidation state as part of the name of the compound. So iron chloride is the name of this compound, but what's the oxidation state of the iron? Is it plus 2, plus 3, plus 4? No, what could it be? We know that the chloride Cl is minus 1. And we know there are three of them, so that makes the chloride contribution a 3 negative. And because in the formula we only have one iron, right, this iron has to be in a plus 3 oxidation state to make this compound neutral. So now we know the oxidation state of the iron. How do we specify this in the name? Simple. We write iron and then Roman numeral 3. The Roman numerals tell us the oxidation state or the positive charge, if you will, of the iron. So this is iron 3 chloride. Notice 
like oxide, like sulfide, the second name ends up with an IDE ending. Yeah? Okay. Now let's talk about polyatomic ions. Ions, either positive or mostly negative, that are made up of more than one type of element. Ammonium is made up of a nitrogen and four hydrogens and has a positive charge. So it's a plus one polyatomic ion. Phosphate. Phosphate is PO4 3 minus. The phosphate, PO4 3 minus. All of the elements in bold here have to be memorized. And in your lab manual, you'll find flashcards in this study guide that you can cut out to help you learn and memorize the polyatomic ions. There's no way you can figure out the charge or the formula of a polyatomic ion from its name. Phosphate doesn't give you any clue that we're talking about PO4 3 minus. Okay? Nothing. You have to just memorize it. The ones in bold here are the ones I expect you to memorize. Here's a list if you want to uh, freeze your um, playback and copy these down. But the easiest thing to do is go to your lab manual, go to the study guide on formula writing, and you will find the flashcards that you can cut out. And then take them everywhere with you until you can look at the formula and say the name, or look at the name and say the formula of the polyatomic ion. So, what is the name of CrNO3? Four. This is NO3, and we've memorized NO3. NO3 is the polyatomic ion with a negative one charge. And there are four of them. So that means you have four nitrates at minus one each. That is a minus four contribution. You also have chromium. Chromium is going to have a plus 4 charge. Chromium 4 nitrate would be the name of this uh, compound. Now, what about the formula of ammonium phosphate? You've memorized both of these. You know ammonium is NH4 plus. You know phosphate is P O four, three negatives. So, what? Uh, how many ammonium are we going to need to balance out one phosphate? Oh, you got it. We're going to need three of them. So the way we do that is to set aside in parentheses the polyatomic ion and then use a subscript to indicate how many ammonium ions are required. Okay? We don't need the parenthesis if it's a one-to-one -one relationship. If you only have one ammonium, you don't put the parenthesis in. So if you have NH4Cl, ammonium chloride, that's how it's going to be. You're not going to put parenthesis around the ammonium ion. Here's another one, MN2SO35. What's going to be the name of that? Manganese. And we have sulfite. SO3 is the sulfite ion. Manganese sulfite. We know sulfite is minus 2 because we memorized it. It's in the list. Gosh, we have 5 of them. So 5 times minus 2 is a minus 10 contribution of the sulfite. Therefore, Plus 5 times 2 is plus 10. Now it's neutral. So we know that each manganese is a plus 5, plus five charge. And we indicate that oxidation state as a Roman numeral right after the manganese, manganese 5 sulfite.